Okay. Get six months in Mokboa. This is going to be part two of my two part lecture on the second lunar cycle. Itoch Kanako Kotoi ni tests. When the rivers freeze entirely over. This is for the Blackfoot Phonology course. Last time, part one of this lecture, I introduced a weather phenomenon that's typical at this time of year. We looked at the migration of waterfowl um, and other birds. We looked at some of our um, summer species like like the mallards we see here who are leaving and then we looked at some other species like the golden eye who are returning these are our winter species who we only who only visit here during the winter this is their blackfoot territory is their summer getaway <laughs> we also looked at uh, some of the technologies the bird nests in particular that are revealed as the leaves in the forest canopy drop at the beginning of the lunar cycle. And we talked about the concept Bomuxin, which is the other half of the relationship that begins with Saponstan, the exchange relationship between, between organisms. Today we're going to look at some of the other species, some of the mammals, including humans, and what are we doing this time of year. We'll look at some plants, maybe an insect or two. And since we left with the technologies, um, I'd like to continue kind of in that vein with uh, something that you may see that is the doings of one of the animals at your sites. And this is a common animal throughout Blackfoot territory. Um, what you're seeing here in this image is a mound from a northern pocket gopher. And northern pocket gophers don't hibernate, so they're active all winter, which means when there's snow on the ground, you can find the areas where they're uh, living at your site, where they're actively living. These guys excavate hundreds of feet of underground tunnels, um, tunnels that bring them to food, tunnels for food storage, tunnels for, you know, chambers for sleeping, areas for using the washroom, you know, they, they excavate large areas, large tunnels, and um, all of that earth that they're moving through, uh, they push up, they take out and push up. Now you won't, you probably will not ever encounter one of these guys. I, I won't say never, but it's unlikely. Um, they don't come out, out on the surface very often, but You will see perhaps um, them throwing the earth out of their tunnels that they're excavating. And when it, like I say, when it snows, you can see where new earth is being cast out and you'll know where there's pocket gophers who are, who are uh, busy living at your site. Another sign that may tip you off to the location of small mammals is the frost on the very cold days. When it comes to very cold days, you can look for frost that accumulates uh, like that in this image, very feathery frost around holes that are basically vents um, to somebody's den. 
right? So if you go up on the beaver lodge, for instance, you're going to see this frost because the beavers have vents. And this, this image here was taken in uh, the forest at the base of a tree where there's a small mammal, a small uh, something living under that tree. And you'd never know it. There's, there's no, um, no obvious den entrance. You'd never know it if it wasn't for this vent and the, uh, and the frost. Now, you can see this phenomenon happen all over the place. It's not just in the forest. Like I said, you can see it at the Beaver Lodge. You can see it up on the high prairies. You know, anywhere, anywhere where there's animals denning and fairly active and putting off heat and their breath, uh, you'll find this. And up on the high prairies, if you look into what it is that's making the frost, um, you might find this guy, Machgatsista, the big rabbit in Blackfoot, which is the white-tailed jackrabbit. This is uh, the second of the three rabbits or hares in Blackfoot territory that I'll introduce you to. We talked already about Sikatsista, the black rabbit. So this guy, the white-tailed white jackrabbit, um, is the largest rabbit in, the, in our Blackfoot territory. And his range seems to be about from the Bow River south. I don't know how far south you can go before where you don't run into them anymore. Um, they like the wide open spaces. They have big territories and they can run, they can, they can run very fast. So, um, some of their defenses that they use are of course the, the changing of the color of their hair their fur so they turn white in winter brown in the summer and they have obviously good hearing their large ears and as I said they run very fast and the coyotes have figured this out though they figured out something about the white-tailed jackrabbit which is when you're chasing them on the prairie, they will run a gigantic circle, <laughs> like a really big circle. So if you have a, a, a couple of hunting partners, you know, one coyote will stay in place when they find the jackrabbit, the other one will chase. And eventually that jackrabbit will run right back to the coyote that stayed in place unknowingly. Like the other uh, Sikatsista, like the black rabbit, the white-tailed jackrabbit doesn't dig a den or anything like this, but it'll use tight spaces that already pre-exist, whether they be dens of other animals um, or just anything, any, any tight space. I believe I took this picture underneath the porch of a house and what they what they will excavate is what's called a scrape, which is just a little divot in the ground, the size of their body, so that they can hunker down and nest in there, nice and tight. So you may find the frost, and it may lead you to a rabbit scrape. Um, those are just some signs to look for. Another sign is the where there have been a lot of deer activity uh, among the males in particular. You'll find, I think, it's, especially in willow patches, they seem to prefer willow, possibly because of its um, 
quality in pain relief. That's just a speculation of mine. But you'll find areas where they rub the velvet on their of their antlers, or they practice fighting with uh, with willow willow trees. And the look is is typically like this. They'll have uh, shredded areas. It's not the clean, um, cut off bark that you would find if if a porcupine or a beaver or something had visited. In fed, instead, you find them shredded. Sometimes the whole tree cut in half and um, cast to the ground. And those are signs of deer in the area. Now, of course, we've got two kinds of deer, two species of deer. We've got the blacktail deer or mule deer, which is isigotoi in, in Blackfoot, which just means his, his black tail. Uh, who we'll talk about during the deer moon mo mostly, but um, we also got white-tailed deer. And if you're in an area that's very brushy, chances are you're going to be more in white-tail deer country in the forest down by the river. You know, the riparian areas are much more white-tail um, habitat. And up on the prairie is much more black-tail. Um, so white-tailed deer in, in Blackfoot are called awatoi. And all the deer belong to a, a category in uh, Blackfoot called awakasi. Awakasi. So if you see a deer, you can you can call them awakasi. Nobody would cor correct you. You're, you're right. <laughs> it's one of those categories of animal. But the specific level name is awatoi, which refers to the way that its tail is waving when it uh, when it leaves when it when it runs away from you. <laughs> white-tailed deer. And at my site, um, I have quite a few white-tailed and black-tailed deer. And in one of, one of the places that I study, I've went ahead and created a, a blind so I can watch the deer. And the deer, one of the species that, you know, during the winter um, that stick around, of course, and are active. And so um, they're, they're kind of nice to watch. Um, to observe and to learn from. This is a, a blind that I made out of a tree that had uh, rotted and part of it had fallen over and it made just the perfect uh, perfect kind of frame to lean branches against to form uh, what I might call a beam, uh, which is like a temporary shelter, but of course also can be used as a blind. And in, you know, in terms of methodologies for uh, learning from the animals out there, sometimes you need a blind. Sometimes you need to um, hide the, your human silhouette or you'll make them too nervous and they just won't. I mean, unless you have the time to be out there all day, uh, or for extended periods so that they can get comfortable with you. Uh, unless you got that kind of time, then what typically happens as you move around your site is that the animals also disperse <laughs> in a wave in front of you. Um, you're a threat to a lot of animals. And only sometimes when you sit still does that sense of threat dissipate after a while and they'll come around you. Um, and like I said, if you got a lot of time, you can just sit still and wait for them to come. Um, but, and this is what, this is the method that you would use if you were vision questing, for instance, you would sit still, but we're talking about sitting still for four days. Right? <laughs> um, but outside of that, you know, you might have to use a blind, something to mask your silhouette. And uh, so this is one that 
one that I made, and of course it can be it's multifunctional. You can use the blind as a, as a an area to observe from, um, strictly observe, or you can also use it as an area to hunt from. You know, if you're hunting, you especially want to mask your human silhouette. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use a um, blind to do that. One of the ways, one of the methods uh, tried and true of hunting the deer is to, uh, and this, this works especially well on antelope too, but it also works on white tail and black tail deer is to just take your blanket out, find an area there where there's where there's deer nearby. Um, in fact, you can even get within sight of them, walk up within sight of them, and then uh, crouch down on the ground and put your blanket over top of you. Sit there like a like a lump. <laughs> it masks your silhouette, um, and the deer will get curious. And they walk right up to you. They walk right up to you to investigate what is this, what is this thing out here in our environment? <laughs> it doesn't look like any animal. It doesn't look like a predator. This lump. And then uh, next thing you know, you know, you've got the deer, right? And this is a, you know, this lunar cycle is a good time for hunting deer. When I taught traditional foods, this is when I would have. Um, my students butcher deer, hunt deer, and butcher deer. Um, and <clears throat> the way of uh, butchering you know, in the Blackfoot tradition is basically to do this kind of a thing. You remove half of the skin on the, well, of course you remove all the innards first, then you remove half of the skin you roll it back over the, that half of the skin and remove the other half of the skin. So you basically end up with a hide um, on the ground that gives you a surface to work on. And then you'll take off each muscle independently. Uh, so you're not just making cuts through the muscles. You're, you're using the natural uh, separations between the muscles and, you're, and you go through and you take each muscle off of the bone. And then what's left, of course, you leave for the others. Um, so I would always feed the remains to, to my good allies, the magpies and, and others. So yeah, that's one of the ways of hunting deer. And there's an, a similar method that's used for hunting the bison, right? American bison, in new. Uh, and as we start getting our, our winter storms, the bison, like the, like the humans, move into the, uh, into the coolies for shelter. And they'd be hunted there. And the method of hunting bison in the coolies, uh, one of the methods that that was learned um, about halfway through known Blackfoot history is the use of boulders, large boulders, as attractants. Um, this, I think it might be one right here. An image, a large boulder that uh, might look somewhat like a bison sitting down or hunkered down. And uh, that boulder, those boulders, you'll find them all over the, the prairies and they're, and they're situated the way that they're situated on purpose, right? This is one thing that a lot of non-Blackfoot people on this landscape don't appreciate is that a lot of what they're seeing was, you know, was sculpted. Um, and they, 
you know, they may not even realize it. A, large, lot, a lot of times if you're walking around in the grasslands and you see these large boulders, they're, they're there for a reason. They're called iniskin, the buffalo stones. And in fact, it was during this time of year that the iniskin revealed themselves to humans initially. In the story, the people are starving. They haven't been able to get any bison. And you got to appreciate that the early hunting was method was a method that was taught by the wolves. So it was basically endurance hunting. It was chasing down the bison on foot, uh, wearing them out, and then, and then making the kill. Uh, so it was really a labor-intensive hunting method. And it is hit or miss. Uh, but once, once the Niskin came along, that changed. And when that happened, like I said, the people were starving. And there was a woman out by the river collecting uh, kidney, the um, rose hips. And she heard, she heard this singing. You know, out of nowhere, this this little voice. She's looking around, and uh, she traces the source of the voice to this stone sitting on a log, and. Uh, and it continues to sing to her. O ma ta ki o ma to ki o me ni ta to so yo ma e a e a e a e a e Says, woman, pick me up, I'm powerful. So she picks up the stone. And <clears throat> it looks like a small bison. And it uh, starts teaching her, teaching her this new technology of using the using the stones to communicate with the bison. Um, to call them in, and so <clears throat> even today you'll find these these stones still around and if you're in cattle areas the, the cattle are still using these stones they're drawn to them and once they come to them and they realize they're not really a, a cow or a bison um, they might still use the stone as a rub you know so a lot of times you find around the bison you'll find shed wool and that kind of thing all around these stones and uh, these stones are used to draw the bison into a location where um, they're ambushed. You know, there might be a good hunter's um, lookout point within arrow shooting range of the stone. <laughs> or it might draw the bison into, into, a, into a tight ravine where you can have hunters up on the edge, on the rim out of sight, shoot down on them. So this changed Blackfoot hunting history like hugely, and the, and the buffalo stones became considered very sacred, and even so still today. <clears throat> one of the elders who I've worked with, um, one of the late elders who I've worked with, put out a challenge. This was... Pat Eagle Child put out a challenge that, um, you know, we still have the buffalo stones. It's up to us now to learn how to uh, use them again, because they were used in the past in this way to really assist Blackfoot hunting uh, subsistence. And so how are we to use this technology today, right? How and, you know, 
not necessarily the straight <laughs> buffalo stones themselves, but the technology, right? Technology using resemblance to draw in what uh, what you want. So these are some of the things that the humans would be engaged in this time of year. The hunting of the deer, hunting of the bison. And also it's a good time of year to start harvesting and uh, working these plants. This is dogbane, this uh, kind of red trident looking plant that you see in the frame here. And in Blackfoot it's called Inuksapis, the little rope. So <clears throat> once these plants have entered winter here, uh, they, get, they get dry and you can harvest these stems. I'll harvest lots of stems and this gives something to do in the evening times um, using the fibers of these stems and twining the fiber into rope. This is why it's called the little rope in Blackfoot. There's just two plants uh, in Blackfoot territory, Inuxapis dogbane and Soxoyatsis sting and nettle. Just two plants that are used for twining and making rope. And, um, and this is the time of year to do it when the stems are dry but not, not uh, too old and brittle. And you basically crush these stems and take out the, the woody and pithy core and just keep the, the fiber, especially the second layer of bark fiber. You twine. So those are some of the human things. Let's look at what some of the plant people are doing this time of year. This is one of my sites uh, along the, at the confluence actually, of the St. Mary's and Old Man Rivers. And this was a very famous place, a very famous uh, gathering place. For for Blackfoot people from the north and south to come together and camp. And uh, so I visit this place sometimes, especially during winter. Um, I tended to have a, <clears throat> it's, it's good to have a, a, a site, a comparison site, but I think only after your first year of phenological study. I think in your first year of phenological study, you should concentrate on one site, visiting again and again and again and again. Don't go elsewhere. But after you've done a year, maybe, then get a uh, contrast model or comparative site that you can go visit. So this is, this is my other site that I visit, and I visit it mostly in winter, but a little bit in summer as well. And uh, I, call the, I call this place uh, the, the snake coulee. There are several places in Blackfoot territory known as this. These are places that are just famous for being um, the habitat, the homes of prairie rattlesnakes. And in this case, there's a, a very healthy population of prairie rattlesnakes here. But there is another older Blackfoot name for this place. Um, Akemisko, which means, <clears throat> well, depending on who you talk to. <laughs> this was the area where the, where Fort Whoopup uh, was in the 1870s when everybody was really highly engaged in the whiskey trade. And um, so some people say that Akemisko became a name after Fort Whoopup was there 
and it, and it means the place of many deaths. But others believe that, that, that the name was always there, Ake Nisko. Um, but it referred to berries, place of many berries, and then only after Fort Whoopup did the did the name start to reflect that history with death? Um, berries in Blackfoot are mean, uh, and death is eat me. And uh, so they're very close. If you say okay, this go could actually be interpreted either way. But I call it Pitsiksinakoachko. And there are some plants in Pitsiksinakoachko that, that, that I don't have at Shpopikimi. Uh, for instance, reed canary grass. It's a little bit of this high on the coolie rims above Shpopikimi, but not very much. Uh, but here at Pitsiksinakoachko, there's lots of it. And this is, this is a very high grass, like five, six foot tall. Um, thick, thick, uh, leaved grass. <clears throat> and it, it's moisture loving. So, you know, where, uh, you can, this is one of the ways you can kind of perhaps locate, um, springs on the coolie side is by looking at the vegetation and looking for where you have these weird outcrops of moisture. Um, so reed canary grass can help you in that way to find the moisture pockets. And usually around the base of the reed canary grass, if, it, if there is a lot of moisture, you also will have Indian rice grass. Now some tribes may have used this, um, the seeds of this species for, for eating. Blackfoot does not have a tradition of eating grain, at least not that's known today. Again, it's, I think I've said this before, it's really difficult to know what all was included in subsistence, Blackfoot subsistence in the distant past because the era of the horse and rifle really fundamentally transformed everything changed everything. Um, there used to be a Blackfoot pottery tradition that was completely absent, you know, by the, by the time uh, people had to go live on reserves. That, that horse era, um, I think, and the waves of smallpox, of course, and all of this, the disease and the death of the times a lot of knowledge was lost, and I think subsistence knowledge as well. Uh, but whether or not there was ever a Blackfoot tradition of eating seeds from these plants is now, a, you know, a, currently at least a, a mystery. But it's definitely not a, a, a contemporary thing. It's not considered traditional today by any. Canada wild rye. It's another very um, obvious grass species. Something that that um, you know is easy to distinguish from other plants. And this is uh, another large grass. I find this along the rivers along the, uh, the floodplain just above the river. And it's, uh, it's, again, like a four or five foot grass. It's pretty tall. Big seed heads. On the Cooley Slope, this is an image of a stem of a very woody shrub. It's been eaten by a porcupine, but the shrub it belongs to is one that you see all over the sides of the coolies, like this, these, all those dark 
patches on the landscape there all are the same kind of shrub. And this is a uh, skunk brush sumac, which we'll visit again later in the annual cycle because there are foods associated with it and other things. Uh, it's a very prominent plant in Blackfoot territory on the, on the plains, especially in the coolies. So, but you can get to know it now. You can, you can see it. It's highly visible out there. These black patches on the coolie slopes. Skunk brush sumac and the Blackfoot name for them um, is one of the names that has been forgotten. Right? This is one of the, the forgotten Blackfoot knowledge is somewhat considerable because of the uh, about a hundred years, but that century of, of break in the culture as things were shifting toward the reservation era. <clears throat> as I'm walking around, a lot of times I will find the, uh, the fruits of cacti, um, in, in particular, the prickly pear, fallen on the ground, as they're supposed to do, to disperse their seeds. The fruit will fall off, and the seeds will get dumped, like you see here. But what you, what you also see here, if you look closely, is that on a lot of these seeds, there's a little black hole that's been excavated into the side of the, of the nut and um, or into the side of the seed to get at the nut. And this is, this is the work of, of mice and other small, very small uh, rodents going in and, and eating this. So this is one of the foods for this time of year for those small rodents. Um, and this happens to be an area like this Bitsiksinakawakko, this site that I'm talking about is an area where I have put up game cams just to survey, you know, what different small rodent species live there and who's eating what and these kind of things. So I haven't figured out for sure who's eating the, 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 the cactus, uh, the prickly pear seeds. I suspect, I suspect that it's a Western jumping mouse, but I'm not sure. You might find evening star, another weird conspicuous plant in its dried up winter stage. You might find the remains of evening star at your site. We'll visit this plant again in summer. This is, this is one of these plants that blossoms in the moonlight instead of in the sunlight and uh, has um, nighttime, special nighttime uh, visitors there to, to pollinate it, the evening star. You'll see very likely at, at a lot of your sites these uh, thatching ant mounds that have been dug up. Uh, this is the work of a flicker, northern flicker coming in and, and uh, trying to get at the the ant larva um, digging into the into the thatching mounds and on warm days even in the winter the western thatching ants which are the largest species of ant in Blackfoot territory um, will come out and, and work on repairs to try to <laughs> fix what the flickers have done uh, the generic term for ants in Blackfoot is Eskokina. Eskokina. Um, like the other insects, right now ants only have that generic name. Whether they, whether we had a specific name for these thatching ants in particular in the past is is not known right now. They might 
they might have been called something like the big the big ant who knows and in blackfoot tradition the ants uh, had a role in helping the moon in the story of the schizogummics the origin of the seven uh, different homeostatic processes that keep life in place on the on earth um, one of those one of those homeostatic tools is the mountains when the mountains were put in place and then the moon <coughs> who was chase giving chase at the time to the sun and their seven children when the when the mountains were put up in front of her as an obstacle she called on Eskokinix the ants to dig a tunnel through that through the mountains for her to um, go through and continue her chase and there are some long caves in the in the Rockies here that that uh, evoke this this story <coughs> the thatching it so again this is another species we'll visit during the summertime as well because there's different things that go on at their at their hives different times of year but this time of year and in fact most most times of the year you can find areas where flickers have been tearing their mounds apart and then you'll find the, the ants working on repairs <clears throat> another insect you might encounter here and there you might find at your site hibernating uh, is the two spot lady beetle this is the most I think we talked about the seven spot lady beetle which is the most prolific beetle in, in Blackfoot territory but that's an introduced beetle this two spot lady beetle is a little bit smaller than the seven spot this is an indigenous species and of the indigenous species, this is the one you probably encounter the most. And they have a, a special mechanism in their blood when it's cold that they, they f can freeze without um, and go into a frozen state um, without the freeze breaking the, the cells in their body. And so when they're un when they unfreeze, they come back to life. This is like the living um, cryo. <laughs> what what do they call that when the when the famous people put themselves on on ice to be uh, revived later? I think Walt Disney's in the in a in a cryo state somewhere. <laughs> um, but yeah, lady beetles have this. They have this system built in. So when the freeze comes, they freeze. You know, they don't slow down, they freeze. Uh, but it doesn't kill them. And they, when they warm back up, they'll come right back to life. And in fact, <clears throat> if you find a, a lady beetle at your site who is frozen in, in the, the hibernation state, if you put it on your hand, the warmth of your hand will be enough to, uh, to wake it up. And it'll, it'll come right back to life. So that's, this is the last slide uh, of, this, of this presentation. And so next we will be transitioning into the third lunar cycle, which is Mesamikokomiatos, the long night's moon. And this is when we get our solstice. Okay.